And a very good evening to everyone. Um, my name is Kip Van Wagner, and I'm part of the team here at the Professional Captains Association. And it's my pleasure this evening to introduce our speaker for this month's seminar series. Um, we are going to be uh, recording this seminar and also putting it uh, up on our YouTube channel. So it will be available for folks to view later on. Um, we have a seminar, uh, our first of the fall. We took uh, a little break over the busy summer. I hope everybody's had a, a good summer and a, and a fruitful summer. And we're picking up again with this series with Captain Ken Lanneman. And uh, Ken has been a lifelong sailor. He's sailed the planet from Norway to the South Pacific and lots of places in between. Um, he comes to us with a de degrees in mechanical engineering and ocean engineering. He's worked on research vessels. Um, he's dived in manned submarines over 2,000 feet deep, holds a 100 ton US Coast Guard license with a sail and tow endorsements. He's an RYA yacht master, both offshore and ocean, up to 200 ton rating. And he's uh, been a professional captain for several years on vessels uh, over 100 feet and has with that position, again, sailed many of the oceans of the world. Um, he's now based in New Hampshire and he joins us tonight to share some insights into navigation uh, over the course of his experience at sea. So without further ado, I'm going to mute myself and turn it over to Ken. Thank you so much, Ken. Thank you very much, Kit. And hello, good evening, everybody. I'm happy you all tuned in. I don't know how many people are there. I don't see it on my screen, but um, I've had a lot of fun putting this together. So I hope you enjoy it too. This is uh, gonna be a little bit of stories from my old sailing and a little bit of uh, platitudes about being careful with the modern stuff compared to the old stuff, but it should be a lot of fun. And hopefully uh, at the end, we can have some good questions and answers and talk about. So what I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna fumble around here and I'm gonna try and share my screen and get this show on the road. There we go, that's the one I want. And I'm gonna just need to get this up to presentation mode. I'm a little slow at this, there we go. So now, does everybody see the title page of this? Production? Yep, you're, you're all good, Ken. Good. Good, to go. good, okay, good great. Excellent. Great, okay. So yeah, I hope this title, this title slide maybe is a little bit of an overreach. <laughs> We're not going to talk about everything with the old and the new navigation. Obviously, you'd never get through that in an hour. I just want to kind of talk about some of the things that I've done in the past uh, from, from way back right on up to the modern age and how things have changed and what was good about the old and what we still need to know about it and what uh, you need to watch out for with the new. If you don't be careful, you can really get in trouble and we'll find some examples of that. So, as you see by the dates here, this does go back quite a ways. I, I was uh, 22, I, got, I was doing deliveries out in the Pacific, got a captain's job on this Choi Lee Clipper 36 uh, catch and sailed all the way to New Zealand and back over the course of two years. And then one thing led to another and, and uh, sort of changed from deliveries to, to uh, private captains on, on private boats and charter yachts. And the boats just kept getting bigger and bigger. And uh, the, the locations changed from the Pacific to uh, the Atlantic Triangle, kind of between the US East Coast and uh, the Mediterranean Europe and the Caribbean and everything in between. And this finally, I finally moved ashore two years ago, but this was my last command. This was a 111 foot um, modern classic sloop. And it was. So uh, much no, better. No, thank you. Not right now. Not right now. Can you see that? Is, I, I didn't hear the, the comment. No, you're, you're fine. Keep going. Oh, okay. Good, good. Okay. Yeah, I heard some voices in the background. I didn't see what it was. But anyway, I just want to show this, this cockpit of this boat. Right. So that, and that little is on. Somebody's not muted. I'm hearing somebody anyway. Uh, but yeah, you can see in this, in this cockpit, we've got a great big multifunction display right there at the helm. Um, We've got uh, on the on the bulkhead here. I've got all kinds of displays for apparent wind angle, depth, true wind angle, speed. Uh, there's an autopilot over here. Bow thrusters down here. These little buttons are for the hydraulic control for the, all the big winches. It was uh, 
quite a big change from a Choi Lee Clipper 36 catch. But you can see I'm still looking up at the sales. You still have to, you can't do everything by computer games. And down below in the pilot hours, I always had a paper chart on the chart table. And really important is the logbook. Never, you always have to do the logbook. Back, back when I was sailing across Pacific, it was essential for the navigation. Without that, you couldn't do a DR plot. But even now, you have to keep a log for legal reasons. And if all the electronic stuff fails, you need that gives you a good backup uh, of position where you were. This picture is when I was coming up the, uh, the, the Straits of Dover here in the English Channel. And if you look closely, you can see a few of the plotted positions on our route. But here's what I was seeing on the electronic display. This is much easier, much better. And you see right here, I've got everything displayed. I've got my position, latitude, longitude. I've got the course over ground, speed over ground. I've got a wind arrow here showing me where the wind's coming from. I've got a current arrow showing the current against me. But maybe best of all, I've got uh, AIS. So I can see some of the other ships and where they're going. And uh, on this picture, <laughs> this, this was just east of Gibraltar, the Straits of Gibraltar. You think 95 is crowded. <laughs> this was, this is all the traffic going in and out. And I was on the south, on the eastbound, the inbound side, which is down on the south. And I needed to cross to get to the north over to the Spanish coast. So you see all these, this is AIS with, with the relative bearings of these selected vessels. This is the relative plot of where they're actually going. So I kind of picked my spot. It was like playing froggy. And I can see where these boats are going to go based on my speed and their speed. And I can see, you know, if it crosses ahead of me like this, they're going to go ahead of me. If this line goes through me, obviously, it's a collision course. So I was able to, to get through this traffic jam of ships. That's pretty common. Couldn't do that back in the 70s. So this is one of the big advantages for sure. And here's one of the reasons why. I mean, <laughs> this is what those targets were. Great big ships. There's another one way off here in the on the horizon. So you don't want to get that wrong. Now, if any of you are really astute and noticing this, if you can see my compass and you can see that the ship is also parallel to it, she would say, wait a minute, I thought you were going across the traffic. This picture was taken at a different time, obviously. I was parallel to the traffic flow in here. Also, we can get radar on that multifunction display. And I apologize for the slightly blurry picture here, but you can see, uh, you know, a electronic bearing line and range. Um, I was monitoring a, a rain squall. Um, that's this splotchy area here is a rain squall. This picture actually shows um, a problem with my radar at the time. It wasn't perfectly well aligned. See, this is an AIS target, and that's the actual radar target. These two should be in the same place. So this was actually misaligned by a couple of degrees. But I thought this picture was kind of fun because I don't know if any of you recognize what that might be. But we're going to be seeing this wasn't uh, this is not reflections off a, a strong target because you see they're not all coming in the same direction. It's not aliens, but we're going to be seeing more of this in our New England waters pretty soon. This was a wind farm, and those those that perfectly arrayed group was all these these uh, uh, windmills in the distance. This was between. Uh, between Denmark and Sweden, there's a lot of them up there. But now I'm, I think you've probably seen this off of Block Island. There's a, there's a line of about six of them that look like that on the radio, radar. So anyway, all that electronic stuff is great. And I, I don't want to poo poo it at all, but I want to just go back through some of the things. I want to raise a few points, 32 points to be specific. Um, this is something that, that I'm afraid I see, it seems to be people are not tuned into this as much as it used to be. But back, back in the old days, it was, you know, you were steering, it was much more difficult to steer a very straight course. And if you could steer, you know, five degrees or better, that that was real good. So typically courses were given in, in points. It was 32 points around the compass. So each one of these points is 11 and a quarter degrees. And to be a, to be a, a able-bodied seaman, you'd have to name all of these points by name, north, north by east, north, northeast, northeast by north, northeast, et cetera, all the way around. And uh, nobody needs, nobody does that anymore now, but it is good to know the, the at least the, the cardinals and intercardinals and know what the, the, uh, the degree 
value for those are. But there's a couple of other reasons that it's good to keep keep the point system in mind. And uh, for example, one of my pet peeves is when people try to tell me something, you know, where the relative location of something is, they invariably say, oh, look over there, uh, one o'clock. And uh, okay, one o'clock. And they're usually pointing something up about, about here. And I say, okay, well, where is two o'clock? And, and they point about here. I say, well, okay, well then where's three o'clock? Oh. So I like to get my crew to try and at least use some of the points, you know, these are the these are the common ones where you say dead ahead or broad on the bow or broad on the beam, broad on the quarter. Those are the easy ones. And then, you know, you one point, two points, three points on the bow. And this is an important one too, that it seems like people don't understand the origin of this, but it's real important. Two points abaft the starboard beam, that's the that's the range of the, the danger zone for the stand on, you know, for not stand on for the giveaway zone for vessels coming up on your in your danger zone, and also the running lights for Colregs, both the uh, the rules and the running lights are based on the point system. And I don't know how people learn it today without understanding points, because you know, looking through the the Colregs, they talk about things in terms of you know 112 and a half points, and this is you know 67 point. I mean, how can you learn that? But if you know, it's just 32 points is an all around light, 20 points is a masthead light. You got 10 points on each side on your side lights, 12 points of stern light and towing light. It's easy. It's much, it's much easier. So that's my rant from the old days. So <laughs> anyway, here's a couple of things that uh, getting into stories and things that another skill that I don't think is used enough these days with all these easy to easy to follow GPS multifunction displays um, is using your compass and, and the depth sounder. To, to sort of feel your way along the bottom. And I've got a good story that goes along with this. This is the Isle of Shoals, which is about six miles off Portsmouth in New Hampshire. These are my home waters. And uh, one night, uh, a dozen or so years ago, my brother and I were sailing out to the Isle of Shoals in his, I think it was a, a little Cal 22 or something back then, but um, we're about halfway across and it was a nice clear night. And then he said, oh, isn't that strange? They go to bed early out there. You know, they're turning out their lights. And I looked over and I said, let's plot a fix right now where we are. And then I said, that, that's not, they're not turning out their lights. That's a fog bank coming in. And sure enough, within, within a few minutes, the fog bank had completely extinguished the lighthouse and everything from Portsmouth and everything. So we were out here in just a total fog bank at night. But we had a compass and a depth sounder. And you can see by the bottom contours, you know, this actually points you in the direction. So we could just take a, take a reading just keep monitoring the reading. And then this is kind of like a warning area as you, as you get near. And we were steering a compass course. We knew what the currents were doing. This is a good check. And then as you get in close, you can follow a, a depth contour around and you can, this, this kind of takes you right into the harbor. Of course, this is a bell, so you hear it. So we did that and we got in fine. But this was a common technique of navigation back in the old days. And, and uh, it's one that people should be familiar with even now. Uh, I usually, I'm always checking my depth sounder, even against the GPS, just to make sure I am where I think I am, which is, which is useful. So here's, here's something, now we're gonna get into electronic charts versus the old charts, and there's pros and cons for both. These pictures, this, this is when I was doing a, a trip from, uh, from Fiji down to New Zealand back in 1970, I think that was 1976. And in, in uh, Fiji, I wasn't able to get all the charts that I needed to come into the Bay of Islands in New Zealand. So this is the only chart I had when I made landfall in New Zealand. And the Bay of Islands is this little section in here, which is about one inch on that chart. I've zoomed it in here. So, so there's, there's a picture of the Bay of Islands. All I had was this and a, and a sailing directions and a book I was reading about Captain Cook, uh, reading about how when he came in, he actually hit this rock right here, which is in the middle of the bay and did a lot of damage. So I was playing it cautious and, and I didn't, didn't want to come in. It was at night. We just come through a, a gale. We'd ripped out some of our sails. We were out here. We'd, we'd picked up Cape Brant. We had the light. But I was being cautious and I wanted to stand off during the night and, and enter during the day. And back in those days, I had a ham radio on the boat and uh, there was a maritime mobile net. And all, all the yachts would check in on the maritime mobile net. So I called in and I just gave my position and told them, you know, I'm, 
I've got to stand off until daylight to make my approach. And there was a guy on a boat in the Bay of Islands in here, a local, and he said, oh no, he said, uh, you must be tired, you want to come in? He said, this is a really easy harbor to enter. There's a range that you can just get on the range, three lights, and, and you know, you can come right on in, come on in and get some, get some sleep. So I thought, well, okay. So came up on deck and, and we were out here somewhere and I started looking in the direction where I should see this light. And it was, it was pretty rough. And uh, finally I saw a, a big red flash and it was right where it was supposed to be. And I started counting, counting timing, you know, the seven seconds or whatever it was came up, I didn't see. But then about 14 seconds later, I saw it again. I said, ah, that must be it, this is great. So we tacked, we, we headed up, started coming in. And then for the longest time, didn't see the light anymore, didn't see the light anymore. And luckily there was a moon, a big bright moon out. And I'm gonna show you on this chart here, this is something I found online. This is the actual, you know, this is more like a harbor chart scale, which I didn't have. I was trying to come in here, trying to pick up this range, but I was actually just a little bit over here, probably was farther out when I turned, so I couldn't see the range, but I was coming in like this and I was heading right for this rock that Cook hit. And finally by moonlight, I was seeing this island and I was seeing breakers and all kinds of stuff. And I lost my nerve and said, okay, forget it. And I tacked, so I went back over on the other tack and went out this way. And then what I did when I got out here, it turns out this range had just been obscured by, by this point. And then I finally got the range and then we came in and everything was fine. But it was a good example of needing to have the right scale charts to, to know, you know, what you're getting into. And the, and the funny part of this story is, the reason I tell it is, not that light that I was seeing that I thought was the range light, this happened to be, uh, I think it was November, forget the exact date, but it was Guy Fox night, which is an English holiday, which they celebrate down there when somebody tried to blow up parliament and they, they were setting off fireworks. There was a firework display down here in but yeah, and I was seeing the red glow of some of the fireworks and I took it for, mistook it for the, the range light. So scale is important. And so with the electronic charts, it's nice because you can get in, you can zoom in nice and close and see the, the real detail. But there are some dangers that I want to point out here. This is a, this is a picture of Bimini um, in the Bahamas. And I used to like to anchor outside right around here, but I was noticed on my on my electronic chart plotter, it had me down here, inside, way over here, somewhere. And the reason for that is, this is something that you need to check. Here on a paper chart, they show you the, the zone of confidence, the level of confidence for the different surveys of the chart. So here's Bimini, here's the coast of Florida. These are the different ranges, A, B, B1, B2, B3. Bimini is B4, which was from sur surveys taken from 1900 to 1939. And down here in the note about the horizontal datum, it said this is using WGS 84. And if you are using anything from like uh, North American datum of 1927, you need to correct it by 1.3 miles and to the north and 0.94 miles to the east. So this is why there's a lot of charts where things are not where they appear to be on your electronic plot. Here's another good example down in the Caribbean in Bequia. I always used to come around this point here and my track would show me going right across this point because this very well charted plot of Bequi was done way back in the 1800s. My GPS position was accurate, but where they plot the chart on the electronic charts is not accurate. It, it is actually, it actually tells you that, you know, you need to correct by so much. So I don't know if this guy was following his charts. This is that West End of Bequi, but that kind of, that kind of, uh, shows you what could happen if you just blindly follow an electronic chart. So back to the old days for, for long trips, this is from going from uh, Fiji to Samoa, uh, from Samoa to Fiji. On a long trip like this, you, you can't really have charts for every bit of the ocean across here. There's some little tiny ones, but a, a cruiser doesn't usually, can't usually afford that many charts. So we only had a few, this was one of the few I had. And when I was doing my route planning on this, this was all by celestial navigation. So there's a lot of really nasty reefs here. And of course the trade winds are blowing this way. So we're coming in like this into this wall of reefs and you can't always get a fix with a sextant. Sometimes it's cloudy. So I had planned my route like this. There's a, there's a little, the northernmost island of Tonga is, is just a little volcanic peak right here, which is really easy to see. And then there's on the northernmost reef right here is, is a, a big lighthouse. And so my plan was to come by, sort of double check my position here and then shoot for that lighthouse 
And if I didn't see it, I was going to wait and, you know, go back and forth and try and get a better fix or whatever. And sure enough, in this leg right in between here, I didn't have any fixes for about two days. So I was running a dead reckoning along this reach here. And uh, it was it was really nerve wracking. But before I get there, I'm getting ahead of myself here. On this big chart, there's a little tiny area in here. You can't see it on the scale, just surrounded by dots. And it said Zephyr Shoal. And um, I looked it up in the sailing directions. And in the sailing directions, it talks about this big shoal with depths of only 16 meters. Now, this this what I've copied from the internet is much more recent. Back then, it was it was from this was back in 1973. 76. I think I remember reading something about a rock, a wash at low tide, even. So I didn't, you know, I thought I wanted to go close by this. We might catch some more fish, but I decided to bend my route and get a little bit farther offshore. But interestingly enough, that night when I went by, I was just reading my old log books. I reported in the log that I was hearing a, a jet for a long time, and I was puzzled that this jet was flying overhead for such a long time. You know, in hindsight, it could have been breakers. I don't know, that just makes it a good story. But anyway, <laughs> it's important to get all the detail you can on these voyages. Here's another one, and I can't show this right, the electronic one from my computer here, but I'll show you what I was doing. This is right here back at home. This is Martha's Vineyard, Falmouth. I was bringing a boat from Martha's Vineyard back up to uh, Hyannis. So I was coming up this, this north channel up in here. And there's, there's a couple of really nasty little shoal areas here. You can see the buoys and the cans. And now on my e-chart that I was using on my, on my chart plotter, the multifunction display, this whole area in here only showed a big blue blob of something, you know, like 12 feet or more. And so I'm coming up here and everything looked fine. But when I got to about here, I wasn't quite making this buoy. We're sailing. And, you know, if you have enough water, sometimes you don't stay right in the channel, especially in a sailboat. So I was cutting it a little bit and trying to squeeze it out without having to tack. And I was getting over in here and I could see off to leeward, I recognized disturbed water that, you know, was a sign of shallower water. So I zoomed my, I zoomed my chart way in, way close, like much, much closer than you would normally use for navigation. And then it showed up that there were these four foot and five foot spots. I was drawing, I drew eight feet. So, so we tacked and got back in the channel. <laughs> but this is a real danger. And this is something that we all have heard about. I'm sure a lot of you guys have seen this. I'm going to play a short video from this Volvo Ocean race from the Vestas Wind. These guys made the same mistake, only their mistake was much more serious. They didn't tack in time. They, they hit a reef at 19 knots. So if you if you just bear with me for a moment, because I'm kind of clumsy fumbling with this, I'm going to try and get this video going. I'm going to try and share that. While Ken's doing that, just to work with the volume is a little, um, no, the sound of the video is just a little grating, just so everyone knows. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point, Kit. This is a, this is a, this is right off their boat camera and it's the, the video and the audio is terrible, but it does, it just, it's frightening to me just to see the reaction. These guys are really scared and it's, it's amazing hitting that thing. At, so does everybody see the picture up here? I'll start it if you do. Is it up there? It sure is. Yes. Okay, good. So I'm gonna start it and hopefully everybody can, oh. Wait a minute, I'm gonna stop it again. And I'm gonna stop the share again because I know there's one little step that I forgot. I've got to get the sound on for you and that's real important. There we go, share sound. Okay, now it's on, now I'm gonna share. There we go, everybody should see it. Now I'm gonna start it. And I'll just play a little bit of this. Yeah, yeah. 
Five hours to daylight, we're on the reef. Bow section. The bow section is fine. The aft can't quite say it's the same. What you just heard was a bit of cracking. Uh, behind the bulkhead doors behind me, there is zero boat left. Rudders are gone. The aft section is fucked. Um, <laughs> yeah. But um, everybody's safe and we're just going to sit tight and I think it's going to be all right. So I'm going to stop it there and uh, go back to where we were. But imagine what that must have felt like. <laughs> all right, let's see if we can get this one back on. Share. All right, are we back to um, back to where we were? All good. All good. Okay, good. So I, I downloaded this. Uh, report of how it happened and read about it. It's really an amazing story. I'll go through it real quickly. Basically what happened was uh, they were starting this leg up until just before the start, there was a lot of piracy around here and they had this uh, no-go zone. Nobody was allowed inside of this red line. And the night before the start, there was a, uh, there was a tropical depression that was coming, approaching from the east that was gonna impact the fleet. And they realized it would be safer if the fleet could just get around it to the north. So they opened up this section of that no-go zone. So the boats were now late, allowed to go up in here in this area. And so the <laughs> most of the boats did this okay and they, they went through it, but apparently on, on Vestas, the navigator didn't zoom in to a deep enough level on his electronic charts. Now, this is what in the report, they say this is a paper chart at this scale, one to 10 million. And here you can see on the paper chart really clearly, and this is big, it's a nice small scale. You've got, uh, I mean, You've got Africa over here, and there's the there's the shoals. You can see that there's stuff there. It's it's very clear, even on this scale chart, even on one in ten million. But what Vestas was looking at when they zoomed down, even down to one to one million, this is all they saw. And this this was from on this chart. It's this area in here. They were just looking at this part of it, and they said, "Oh well, that, that looks pretty good. There's some soundings here, at 30, 40, 20. So navigator told the captain that. You know, it's going to be some shallow water, but um, the weather looks good. We're not going to have any dangerous stuff. The skipper was more concerned with bad water. They never zoomed down deep enough because the only computer that had it was a different, they were using a different computer for weather. If they had zoomed down to this scale, there it shows this, there it shows the reef very clearly. And they chose to sail right across it. And it wasn't a little thing. I mean, this is a huge, big reef. And they hit that thing. 19 knots in the dark and I mean it's uh, it's amazing to me that nobody was injured and I think it's only because the great the daggerboard went down so hard so deep when that sheared off that absorbed a lot of it and then the bulb on the keel caught in the rocks and spun them around and then but th that to me is just an amazing an amazing uh, course of events hope it never happens to any of us so let's uh talk a little bit about weather this is this is a modern picture here. And I now if, if you have, you know, sat phone and all kinds of setcoms and good weather, you can get this stuff even while you're on route, the whole North Atlantic and see what's coming in for four days. You can even get grid files and, and you know, the wind directions. And this is really nice. Um, I've been using that for the last many years, but back in, uh, back in seventies, this is how I did it. I, I found this when I was going through things, looking for things to take pictures of. This is kind of funny back Back then, there was a Morse code broadcast on, on high frequency. And they were sending it 20 words a minute. They would send these groups of uh, five number groups. So you could collect, there's a whole page full of numbers. And each number group represented a different isobar. And what you do is you would plot these points. 
this would be point here, point here, point here. And then you go to the next isobar and that's a different group, these points, these points. And then you could draw out all your isobars. And same thing, they had the same thing for the fronts and they had things for conversion zones. They had highs and lows. So I've gotten a couple of uh, conic projection charts from the New Zealand Met Service before I left, but I only had a few, so I ran out of them. So then I just started doing it on graph paper. It didn't really matter if it was right or not. It just gave me the big picture. But I mean, that, that worked for me. It told me what was coming a little bit and I could spend the whole day just decoding Morse code. <laughs> didn't have any charters on board. So also in my treasure chest, I found some of my old plotting sheets where I used to plot. And I thought this would be fun to show. This is, a, you know, crossing a big ocean, you don't have charts to plot on. And the scales of the charts that you do have in the ocean, you wouldn't be able to plot a, a watch run of 18 miles or 20 miles or whatever you did, it would be too small. So we always kept, uh, we use these universal plotting sheets, which are really handy. And notice on the plotting sheet, you've only got latitudes that are printed. And so depending on what your, la what your latitude is, you can draw in the longitudes at the right scale. And they give you this little nomogram at the bottom. You can do it that way, choose your mid latitude. And then this line is what you put your dividers on to get the distance of, you know, of what one degree of longitude would be. And then you plot it on your chart like this. The other easy way of doing it is the formula for that is it's just the cosine of the latitude. So this, this is a cosine right here, you just go up to See, we were at 30 degrees, so this goes up to 30, and then just drop the line straight down. So, so these are the longitudes, and there's latitudes, and then at each person coming off watch would enter the logbook, and they would record their distance run in the course they steered, then they'd put in their best, you know, they'd plot it, and it would go along. And meanwhile, I'd be taking uh, sites with a sextant. This is like a, a sun site here. And then at noon, I'd get a, a noon site, and or here's one down here, and then that would be a fixed. And so the DR plot, plot would invariably be in a different place because it's current or something take us. So I'd end that DR plot and then we start it fresh from the fix. And then we continue on like this. And on this particular chart, this is one where we were approaching Bermuda. So in this case, I actually drew in, in pencil, this is the shape of Bermuda. We're coming up north from the Caribbean. So I just kind of drew in roughly where Bermuda was. And um, Here's another use of those universal plotting sheets for, for doing my site reductions. These are a couple of really nice sites. I'm really proud of them. I get, you know, they don't always come out this nice, but this is a whole bunch that they all came out together really nice. So I would take these fixes and then I would plot them onto the dead reckoning plot. So we're just about, you know, I'm almost 35 minutes into it. So this just kind of sums it up and we'll turn it over to some Q and A or other, other people's stories and, and adventures. But this is what, I hope you take away from this that, that all these high tech game changers, these really are game changers radar, GPS, AIS, multifunction displays, electronic charts, satellite comms, weather forecasting, autopilot. They're all fantastic. And I, I think they're great. And of course, I've been using them now for the last couple of decades and I love them. And, but I think it's so important, especially for new people coming up, not to lose sight of the history of navigation and the skills that were developed. And those skills are still relevant and we shouldn't lose them. And things like paper chart plotting, steering by compass, fixes, you know, actually taking bearings and, and plotting fixes on the charts. Like I explained, using depth con contours, you know, all the skills of piloting and celestial navigation, if you're going offshore, we shouldn't lose sight of that stuff because it's so important. And um, I love these little three rules, three essentials of navigation. This, this would be so important for those guys on the bestest wind. I mean, the basic golden rules are, you know, Number one, know where you are, start. Number two, know where you want to go. And number three, know what is in between. And that's so important now is we use all these electronic things just by switching scales and switching zoom levels. You really want to make sure that you know what's in between. And the last one, this is my own words, never put your situational awareness on autopilot. I think that's really important. Always check everything and say, does this make sense? Is that where it ought to be? Are we doing it right? So that really sums it up for me. I'm going to stop sharing here. And then um, actually, I'll just leave this screen on. And Kit, if you want to be the mediator, and if other people have questions or want to share some stories, um, I'm done yakking. Absolutely. Back over to you. Thank you so much, Ken. That was fantastic. Um, great. Some great stories, some great insight. Uh, I, I open the floor up to anyone who might have some questions. Um, you may just need to unmute yourself so that we can all hear you.
I guess I did my job too well, right? Everybody gets it. <laughs> That's always a <laughs> no good question. Plan. How about stories? Anybody got any good stories of similar, like almost mistakes or similar, similar things that actually went wrong that could have been avoided with using the old way? <clears throat> You know, I know a couple of other stories while well, I wait for people to think of things that, you know, on that picture of, uh, let me see if I can go back to it, when I was showing that picture of coming into Fiji, where was that? And that was right about here. You know, I mentioned, this was a really scary part right here. This is uh, the Lao group of the Fiji Islands, and it's a bunch of, a bunch of low reefs and things. And then to the north is Vanua Levu, and there's a bunch of reefs up here. I was coming in this way with the trade winds pushing me towards this wall of reefs here in the dark, no, no real navigation. My only beacon was this big lighthouse on the northernmost reef of the Lao group. So this was essential that I saw that. And as I explained before, as I came on this last leg here, I'd had two or three days of, of no sights. So I was on dead reckoning, which, which was frightening really, knowing that I was heading for a wall of reefs without really knowing where I was. So when I got to this point where I should have been seeing the lighthouse when at dusk, I looked and looked and looked and looked and I didn't see the lighthouse. And I, once again, I lost my nerve here and I tacked and went back and started going back this way. And on the other tack, I was able to, we only had rat lines on one side of the mast. On the other tack, I was able to climb up the rat lines up to the spreader, even though it was kind of rough out there, but I climbed up to the spreader. And from that height, I was able to see the lighthouse was there, in fact, and I was able to see it. So I took a deep breath and said, okay, we went back around and we, you know, went down this final shot and came into Suva and that, that worked out fine. But that's another good example, you know, using the light list to know the height of the light and the distance you can see it is really critical information. And from the deck of a small sailboat, especially in waves, I think a lot of those distances are really set up for ships, you know, people on the bridge at 30 feet. So once I went up the mast, I did see it, but that was another nerve wracking story. So Ken, uh, question. When okay. You're, when you're dead reckoning over those kinds of distances in the middle of the ocean, how do you integrate current into your well, calculation? That's a great question. And, uh, I think that DR plot shows it really well. Here's a good case of when, at this day, if you see the time of this fix, it's like 1216. And that was when I had local apparent noon. So I got a perfect latitude fix or latitude line, line of position at, at 1216 at local apparent noon. Now that morning I had taken a morning sun site. Now I, I don't know how many are familiar with celestial navigation, but when you take a site, all you get is one line of position and it's perpendicular to the direction of the body. So when you take a noon site, the sun is due south. So your line of position is perpendicular to the bearing of the body. So you get a perfect latitude. That's why that's the most common one. It's the easiest and you get a nice latitude. But in the morning, you can shoot a site when the sun is due east. And so I, I got this nice line of position here, which is almost a perfect longitude. And then I just advanced it using this, you know, the course and distance we had steered from the time I took that to the time I took the noon site. And then I got this, which is a running fix. That's not a real fix, it's a running fix. So I knew this is where I, this is where I was at that time. Now the DR plot at that time, the 1205, said I was here. So our latitude was pretty good, but you can see we were a long way off in longitude. So we had actually been taken by the current quite a long way. So I just blocked it off and then we start the debt reckoning plot from the fix now and now we get going again and then the same thing happens again now this next one was much closer that the fix was very close to where we were in the dr plot probably below this there were probably a few days of just dead reckoning with no fixes and we had we hadn't been able to recalibrate for a day or so so we were pretty far off course but once we get a good fix then that puts us right back on track and you know the next one here when i, I would usually at, at sea i would usually do only a noon site and maybe a morning or an evening site so I could get a running fix like this. But as we approach a, a landfall where it's important, then I would start taking star sites in the morning and star sites in the evening and getting a real accurate fix, not having to wait for a running fix. And that's, you know, then we were really sure as we approached land where we were. So, you know, within a few miles and uh, that's good enough for a landfall. 
So uh, does that answer your question? I mean, we were recalibrating with a sextant essentially is how we were taking care right. of it. Well, actually, no. The question okay. really more specifically is, you calculated that there was a certain amount of current there that you were able to derive from your 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 calculations. Yeah. Did you use that to uh, bias your dr plot? Knowing uh, I see. Yeah. It, yeah. That's my question. Um, yeah. Great. That's a great question. That that's right along the line with a, like a, a yacht master course where you're actually plotting an estimated position. You take all those things into account. No, I was just having the crew plot. The distance, of course, the distance they had run and the course they'd done. And we didn't even try to correct for current. Uh, that was just a strictly just a rough DR plot. No, no current, no leeway, in fact, for the boat. You know, if you're doing an estimated position, you need to take into account, you know, a sailboat doesn't sail straight, you know, it makes some leeway. So, you know, if, if it wanted to be real precise, like after maybe after coming into a, a landfall after a good fix, and I wanted to be sure where I was, I might have added something in saying, okay, the current or the tide is now affecting me this way. My estimated position now is not here on the DR plot. It's actually a little bit east of it or whatever. But that, yeah, that's a good question. But on these these simple dead reckoning plots, we just were doing whatever the people did. And it's funny because, you know, we were, I was down, especially in the Pacific, you know, I was 22 and, and I was one of the older people on board. There were a couple others that, you know, one was 19 and another 20. You know, we were just having a good time and you know, they weren't steering real straight courses either. And <laughs> so at the end of a three hour watch, they would have to estimate what their best guess of what the course they made, you know, and it right. Right. wasn't always right. That's why we have to correct it. Do you find but, that in general, currents are fairly consistent in deep water out in the middle of the ocean or? Um, yes and no. I mean, wind really affects currents a lot, but there are some basic ocean currents that, you know, I did always have uh, pilot charts and um, I'm, I'm tempted to bring a picture of one up here. I've got it in my computer somewhere, but I probably waste too much time fumbling around trying to get it on screen. But, you know, the, the printed pilot charts are great. They have uh, all the currents for the different months and where the typical currents are. And it would give you a good idea, especially for planning. You know, in the, in the passage planning, you would use that and you'd expect that you'd be getting a current setting you this way. But the wind drift current is substantial. So if you're in the trade winds and the wind's blowing steady 25 knots, 20, 30 knots all the time, there's a substantial drift from that, just from that wind drift. And when the, when the trades die off, sometimes you get a, something that goes by and the trades die off and that current ends, you know, you, you might be, have a very different expectation of where you might be because you're not being set. You might even have a current taking in the other direction. Right. Nowadays, of course, the data is out there so easy to get. You can, <laughs> well, you get your GPS. You know how much right. <laughs> right. yep. Yeah. Yeah. Good questions, though. I like Thank that. you. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Anything else for Ken here this evening? Any other burning navigational questions or comments or stories? Cool. Well, thank you so much, Ken. We really okay. appreciate it. Um, this has been a, a great seminar. And uh, actually, I have a question. Oh, go ahead. Question. Okay, Pete. Yeah. Yep. So, Ken, what, what are you doing these days? Well, like I said, I just I just kind of finally uh, threw ashore my anchor, and I've I've uh, come ashore from the, my last job there in that big 111 foot boat, and um, that was about that was November of 2019. So that first year, I got a job in engineering, doing real, you know, nine to five, well, eight to five, eight to six, <laughs> commuting, commuting an hour each way. It was terrible. Actually, COVID kind of saved me on that. We could all go remote. That was nice. I was working for a defense contractor and doing a lot of stuff with sonar. I was, I studied ocean, underwater acoustics. So that was kind of interesting, but um, that commute was killing me. And after the COVID thing, and they wanted to come back, I've, I've kind of gotten back this, I stopped doing that about a year ago. And this summer I've been just doing uh, training. I, I've had a lot of fun doing uh, teaching people how to drive boats. You know, with, <laughs> it's kind of fun. And now I'm uh, now I'm gotten together with Captain Kent and uh, Kit and Confident Captain. I'm going to start doing the training up here in the northern section, up around New Hampshire, Vermont, Maine, Massachusetts, whatever. Uh, so people don't have to drive all the way to Rhode Island. So I'm going to do the first one uh, starting in uh, November first. Cool. And do you, this is sort of a non sequitur and you may not have an opinion, but any comments on forward looking sonar? I, uh, 
that's a great question because when I, one of the companies I worked at, when I, I had moved ashore for about 20 years when my daughter was born and grew up, um, I was working for a company that was actually building the transducers for that. And mm -hmm. I was working with one of the pioneer companies, uh, Far Sounder, that started doing that. And it seemed like a great, great product. And I think it's really popular now on some of the bigger yachts that can afford it. And you can see things long before you hit them. Um, I don't know specifically what your question is, but I think the more information you have, the better if you know how to use it right. If, you know, if you don't depend on it in the wrong way or... I, you know. I actually worked on a vessel in Antarctica where there's very few charts and what there is is very poor um, yeah. in terms of data. So we had the forward facing um, plotter and it was fantastic. I mean, Great. you really could see in 3D what was coming up. So of course we would just reduce speed where we were, you know, wondering what was up ahead of us and, and yeah. that, and that. It, was, it was great. Was it often a whale or something or, or an iceberg? Uh, no, no, it, 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 it looks like um, the fish, the fish finders. I mean, it, it really was a nice um, 3D view of, of the ocean floor. I think those are coming down in cost now. And I think more and more yachts are starting to get them. I know some of the bigger power boats that we used to see, they usually had them. And, you know, when you're navigating around coral reefs and things, the bottom comes up very abruptly. So your depth sounder doesn't really help you. If you're getting near the edge of a reef, you're going to hit it soon. Mm -hmm. So with forward-looking forward sonar, is a great idea. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Thank, Thank you. you. Just, uh, oh, just one comment. It's, uh, it's Tony. I'm one of the, uh, one of the instructors at, at Confident Captain. Um, and I, I just, oh, over the years, what I've noticed is, uh, Ken is old school. I'm, I'm still a bit of old school as well, but most of us have, if we have not forgotten what we used to be able to do, we never knew it in the first place. And as a result, we've grown to rely on the GPS and the chart plotters and everything else. And, and that's okay. It really is okay. You just have to learn to figure out what the problems are going to be. Now, the Vestas uh, incident is one of the, the prime examples of that. It's often just as simple as just zooming in more. Whenever I do a, a, a long distance route, I do the, the, as I was saying earlier to Ken, I do the macro first and then I do micro. I take it down to a, a mile range and I go through every single mile of that route that I've just laid, looking for any problems that I might've caused. And as far as the, the currents in the middle of the ocean question, I mean, that's a great question, but I'll, I'll tell you, a lot of that you only figure out once it's done, once you're done with the trip. It's not something you figure out. I mean, the, the pilot charts are awesome, but I can tell you um, over years of working in a, in, a, in a chart shop, the amount of pilot charts that I sold to people was negligible. People just, if they're not aware of them, they don't know how to use them. So um, the, the, the lucky thing is the GPS will tell us what the set drift is if we know how to use it right. But don't despair if you don't know how to use all the stuff that Ken talks about. I mean, I, I used to be able to do sun sites. I doubt I could do one now. Um, Ken probably still can, but it's, it's not something that people are doing these days. So you have to compensate in other ways and know how to use the wonderful um, array of electronics that we have. We had an incident just the other night here in Rhode Island where you had a, a perfectly outfitted radar equipped, chart plotter equipped boat hit one of the largest jetties uh, in the state <laughs> in perfectly, you know, you know, not bad weather. The only problem was it was dark. So if you don't know how to use all this neat stuff, do it slowly, put your training wheels on. That was a great, great talk, Ken. Thanks very much. It was a pleasure. To well, thank you for your comments, Tony. Tony, that was very well spoken. What you said was exactly, exactly uh, kind of the crux of what I was trying to get at is I really, I really hope the new generation of people come up um, at least get some of the background. I don't need to be um, all the little details, but I really think it's important to to be able to navigate and pilot, at least coastal piloting. Not everybody goes offshore, but uh, GPS, we depend on so much, but it is so fragile. I don't think people realize how fragile it really is. I mean, even on your own boat, I mean, it might just be your batteries die or something like that, you know, and um, I guess most people carry little Garmin handhelds too, just in case, but um, you know, solar flares, for example, a, a good sun, sunspot activity. This happened about oh, 20 years ago, or I forget when it was, but it was maybe maybe more than that. There was a big solar storm, and it actually knocked out a whole bunch of 
electronic stuff on the East Coast in Canada. And luckily it was before the GPS stuff was really being dependent upon, but all it takes is one good solar flare to knock out those satellites. And then all of us that are depending on those wonderful satellite signals will just be out of luck. Uh, and you're gonna have, need to have a backup plan and you really should know how to pilot, like take a bearing of something on land and be able to steer by your compass and that sort of thing. And of course, uh, you know, I hate to bring up the possibility, but in, in a condition of war, those GPS satellites are the primary target. So, you know, <laughs> enough said, but we should all be able to navigate <laughs> without, we should be able to navigate or at least pilot around the coast. Well, there's, a reason, can... there's a reason that both the Chinese and the Russians have developed their own satellite navigation system. That's right, that's right. <laughs> and you know, a lot of people I know have actually got radios that have, you know, uh, they have all, they're able to pick up all the satellites, not just the US constellations, but they can pick up the other constellations too. So. <laughs> yeah, well, hopefully, hopefully that won't be a situation, but it, it's always possible. You know, another thing that, that uh, I didn't even bring up, it's another a little danger that, that should be talked about more is spoofing. Somebody did their graduate thesis on this. You can actually spoof the signal from another boat. You can send a signal to the other boat. And they actually did this. He did it for his, his graduate thesis. And so if a boat was going along on autopilot using a GPS signal, a bad actor could actually jam his signals and make him think that he was receiving good signals and actually steer him into a reef. This is what this guy did on his project. So, I mean, that's something else that it's kind of like hacking. I think it's a big concern in the future that people will need to be aware of anyway. So my, my advice is don't forget how to do old school piloting, at least. You don't have to know how to use a sextant. Although I'll be happy to teach a course in that. It's really easy now, easier than ever. Anyway, Tony, thanks for your great words. They were really well spoken. Oh, great, great words on your part too, Kat. A pleasure. Good. Now, thank you very much. Incredibly valuable. It's great. fun stuff. Well, thank you all for participating. Uh, we hope to see you on the next seminar and uh, we'll be sending out notes about that soon. So thanks very much. We're gonna sign off from the Professional Captains Association and everyone have a good night, have a good rest of the week and see you around. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.